I want to thank everyone for coming out this evening or this morning or whatever. And, uh, this is uh, an information meeting and uh, there is an opportunity to take for us to take action on it. But before we get started, if everyone is taking this bow your head, I want to take him for a prayer right quick. Father, we want to take and thank you for the opportunity that we can take and come together as a group of people, as a, as a community, the Lord, and uh, be concerned about things in our community. And Lord, you give us opportunity also we can take action and you give us uh, the wisdom and the knowledge that we can take and do these things in, in a responsible way. Lord, we can't do all this on our own. But I do know, Lord, that if we take and seek you and ask for your guidance, that you're are very, very diligent about taking and giving it to us, Lord. Because you said if we any of us lack wisdom, just ask you and you give it to us abundantly, Lord. So Father, we want to thank you for everything you do for us each and every day. And that's just in the name of Jesus. Amen. This is a, a public meeting, and as everyone come in, I hope everybody got signed up back there at the back. Uh, it is a requirement that whoever attends, that they do take it and sign up. Put your name down, and we'll just take and go from there. Uh, we're not going to take and send you a bill or nothing like that, so. But it is one of the requirements. And, uh, if you have questions, if y'all would, wait until we get the, the program presented. And I hopefully that whenever we get the program presented and everything's laid out here, that it will answer a lot of your questions. I know there's probably two or three questions on your mind, and they will be answered. This is what we're taking and striving for. Uh, also, for those that's never been in here before, the restrooms, right through this door here and back to the right so if anybody needs that so you won't have to be looking around everywhere <coughs> the responsibility that the hospital board is taking undertaking is uh we see a need that is cropping up is coming up and we wanted to take action on it because everything that we're doing now is going to take and influence us. But folks, it's also going to take and influence our children and our grandchildren. Because what we're planning now is something that will take and be very viable and very doable for the next 20 years. I probably won't be here in 20 years. But I do have children that's going to be here, and I hopefully have grandchildren that's going to be here. And I want them to take and have a health care system that they can take and go to and get good care. So that's what our goal is. Because we recognize that there is some problems and there's some issues that is coming up and we're going to take and address those. And one of the things that we've taken and learned also is... Uh, we're trying to be good stewards of what we have. Uh, Bailey County is a very unique place. We don't have a great big tax base, so we don't have a whole lot of tax money. So we have to be very, very good stewards uh, of what we have. And we believe that we've been, been good with it. And, uh, but it's coming to the point now that we're going to need to take and make a decision to take and do something to take and help make sure that we have health care in the next 20 years. I'm not taking doing any scare tactics. We're just going to take and lay out the facts and tell you all exactly where we're at. Before we get started any further, I want to take and introduce a few people. I want to take and introduce the board. We have Gail Richardson right here, Zona Gatewood, Dana Rasco, I'm Alan Smyre, uh, Landon Nichols, uh, unfortunately, kind of feeling a little rough, so he's not here tonight. So that's uh, the five people that you have on the board. We have Dennis Fleener, 
our hospital administrator. Then we have Stephen Lawson, Jason, Josh, I'm sorry, Josh. <laughs> then we have Clay Benford and Robert White. Okay, these guys over here are the ones that are going to be taking, bringing the program to you and presenting what uh, they have arrived at. These are folks that we have taken and hired to take and have the expertise of taking and progressing on. There's so many things going on to take and get this to the next step that we do not have the, the resources within our own selves to get that done. And that's the reason we have to take and hire these. There's a lot going on in the healthcare industry and a lot of rules and regulations that we have to follow. That's the reason that we have these folks. And I'm glad to have them on board. The first thing that we're going to take and do is going to take and uh, have Robert White to take and come up. He is the financial advisor and he's going to take and he's going to take and answer some of the hardest questions first. Because if we don't have the money to take and proceed on, we don't need to be doing what we're doing right now. But he's taking and showing us what we can do and where we can go. And uh, Robert, you need to stand up here or what do you need? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I'm vertically challenged, so uh, I might use it if I can up here. Everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right, my name is Robert White. As, as he said, uh, I'm with Samco Capital Markets. Um, Samco has been around for 30, 40 years and one of the largest players in the municipal finance business. Um, for example, we represent Yulshu ISD. Um, and so we have about 85 of these types of transactions that we do uh, with my team a year, uh, worth a couple billion dollars. And so every company is slightly different, which makes this job fun. And um, so I appreciate your time tonight. And I'm going to be somewhat brief, but I wanted to go ahead and get some of the financial pieces uh, on the table here um, that we'll be ultimately discussing. Is that better? And y'all have this that you were going to shine, or you want me to just go yeah. off here? Did you all want to shine this on the screen? There we go. Okay, uh, so a couple of pieces that we always take into account as we're potentially planning a bond election to the extent that a community has a want or a need uh, that they're desiring and they are trying to be financial stewards. They call us in and we help them through the bond election process as well as selling the bonds to the market uh, and all the paperwork, et cetera, that goes along with such transactions. And so the first place we always look in is to take a look at the statistics of the community that we're looking at and what is that comprised of. And, and here in Neilshu, um, you guys have a very stable community from our perspective. A lot of districts, mainly out west even, um, we have really high oil and gas values, which creates a taxable value that fluctuates uh, over time and can happen very rapidly. Here in Yilshu, as we look at your tax base, you guys have kind of steadily increased over time and are now currently at around $377 million, uh, for your certified values this year. So that's one aspect we always look at is how do we... How do we look at your statistics and create a bond model that will survive the test of time or survive any economic cycle that will hit a community? Because that's what we want to do, is put something in place that one, you guys can afford, and two, are not going to have any surprises uh, in the future for you. So uh, you're going to see up here, if you can read it, the taxable value that we're assuming here is $365 million, which is about $12 million less than your current value. Okay, you've not really had any year in the past 20 years that I'm seeing where you've gone down in value. But that being said, conservatism always leads the way here on designing a bond model that will stand that test of time. So we're, we're always going to be preaching conservatism, 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 so that you are not surprised. So one way we do that is the taxable value, which I just described. The next is the interest rate assumption. I read an article uh, this week, which I thought was somewhat funny, in that the last time interest rates were this low, Eisenhower was president and Elvis Presley released his second album. 
And so 1956 is the level that we're surpassing right now in interest rate levels. It's, it's truly unbelievable. We've had about nine of these deals in the market um, in the past 10 days or so, and some of them are 30-year type bonds, like a home mortgage, that we're selling at 3% type rates. And so anytime we see money at less than 4%, we're just kind of flabbergasted by it. But 3% is just truly kind of unheard of. <laughs> yeah. It is a very good rate. And so, but that being said, I can't come in here tonight and say, I can guarantee a 3% rate if you guys choose to move forward with an election in a couple months from now, because you just never know. So another way we add conservatism to the bond model is we add conservatism to the interest rate. So tonight I'm showing around 3.6% interest rate as another layer of conservatism. And then everything that we're going to show here are fixed rate bonds. And so we're not looking at any kind of uh, interesting structure or variable rate stuff that could reset on you and change that rate. So once you lock in a rate, it's locked in for the life of the bond to the extent you don't refund, refinance it at lower rates, which might be hard to do if rates hold up where they're at. And then we assume a collection percentage of 98% and it's just level debt service. A lot like a home mortgage would be. Your annual payment or your monthly payment is level. It's the same every single month. That's the kind of philosophy we would approach the structure here for this community. So, and then the other thing we always want to do is take a look at the useful life of the assets that you're looking at. You don't want to finance computers over 20 years when their useful life is probably five or less, right? And I know we're not looking at computers, but it paints a pretty good picture. So. We're showing 20 years here on the structure, which is easily under the useful life of the assets you're looking at. So that's another layer of conservatism and bond model planning. So if we can scroll down just a tad. The other, the other thing we want to do is we want to show you a range of values, right? A range of bond election values or scenarios. Um, because ultimately, these things can change and uh, people can ask questions in meetings like this, well, what about this, what about this? And so we just like to have a range here, but what we have been talking and discussing about and kind of focusing in on is the $9 million range. So the scenario two has been kind of a focal point for us. So 9 million over 20 years at 3.6% is roughly 640,000 of annual debt service uh, for the hospital district. And at a current uh, INS tax rate of 7.67, uh, since it would raise it 10.23 cents there in yellow to 17.9 cents. So there on that second line is 10.23 cents for 9 million. So that's the finances as they apply to the hospital district. And typically at this point, everybody's saying, okay, that's, that's great. I see the tax rate, but what does that mean to me? And what does that look like uh, on my home? Because these are property taxes. So what does a $9 million scenario two look like on a $100,000 home? It is $102.30 a year, which is roughly $8.53 as a monthly projection. So to the extent you voted, if you move forward with the calling of a bond election, and you called it and was, were successful, that's how much your property tax would increase on a $100,000 home. Now everybody has different home values and so that that changes depending on what your home value is worth, but 100,000 is what we're required to show in the um, in the parameter documents, the election documents, and so forth. And so, and it's the easiest math. So, eight dollars and fifty cents a month for supporting a nine million dollar bond election. Now obviously, there's multiple amounts here if um, so desired, and we can get into it. But ultimately, I think that that's what we were focusing on. So, all right, I think. Unless there's any questions for me at this point, I can always chime in as you move along with the actual projects and discussing uh, analysis and change. Thank you, Robert. Uh, like I say, if y'all would, just, if you got a question, write it down and we'll answer here in a little bit. I don't want anybody to come out of here that doesn't have a question being answered. Right now, I want to take and turn it over to Stephen Lawson, and uh, he's an uh, architect that we have been working with. He's from Reese Associates from Oklahoma City, and uh, he's very familiar with our facilities, and he's helped us on a few other things. So, thank you, Stephen. 
I got to get accustomed to this first because it's really awkward to hear yourself. So, in a second. Um, I'm not on the top of my game tonight. I, I regret the hot dog I had at the truck stop in Amarillo on the way here. So, I got my water. I'll do my best. I'm Stephen Lawson with Reese Associates Architects. We have offices in Oklahoma City and Dallas. We're primarily a healthcare architecture firm. We've been in business about 45 years now, so we've been around a while. We primarily focus on healthcare, and within healthcare, we really specialize in rural and community <coughs> hospitals. Um, I have, I'm a licensed architect. I have 24 years experience, so I've been doing this for a little while now, and, and I still enjoy it, so I'll keep doing it. Um, as mentioned, I've been coming out here and with my colleagues, Josh and others, for roughly four years now uh, for multiple things, looking at the hospital. There's lots, been lots of ideas over the years. Well, what about this? We came out one time with the engineers and spent a whole day, and the engineers uh, did a full assessment of the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems within the building. We've done some studies of, for example, how to grow Dr. Purdy's clinic at one point. We helped with some interior renovations of, of two small clinic pods. If you've been down there, you notice they've been painted and refreshed, kind of on the south end of the facility. And so we've been noodling on this for, for about four years, just looking and meeting and talking, doing some drawings. And what you see here tonight is kind of a culmination of all that. So I'm excited to be here tonight after four years of, of talking about this and, and working on it. To, to get to this point, to, to talk to y'all about it. Um, what you're seeing here is a drawing of, of what we think is a good idea, and we've presented it to the board a few times. We have met a little bit with the staff, but really what the goal is, is if the bond issue is successful, we will update this and renovate and, and adjust this. But what this is meant to do is capture the scope of work and the main ideas behind what this hospital renovation for this $9 million bond issue would look like. So also, I think it's important to note not all of that $9 million would go to this project in the hospital. There's some needs out at the, out at the nursing home. It's getting a little bit aged, so we're talking about some of that heat and air. No? Okay, so that's a change. <laughs> Strike that. <laughs> so what we have here is a drawing that's primarily organized around a couple ideas. And the idea number one, I'll just walk around here, is getting the clinic facilities consolidated in this area. Focusing on the, on the outpatient services in the middle, and then bringing in some renovation to the existing hospital. So what this means is really a centralized check-in and check-out and waiting room for all of the outpatient services with new handicapped bathrooms and really cleaning up some of the circulation, new finishes. Over here, we're talking more about utilizing the old OBOR area and creating a new emergency department with a new ambulance, dedicated ambulance entrance off to the back, consolidating a new waiting room, moving administration and admitting over to this area, and really creating a new central hub in the center of the hospital with a new emergency department works. A new centralized nurse station here with that can serve the emergency department, but as well, I keep getting too close to that, don't I? And the nurse station would also serve the inpatient unit. There's not a considerable amount of interior renovation with regarding to moving walls and totally tearing out the insides of the facility and redoing it. After all of our investigation, as well as our engineers' investigation, we believe that, that the structure and the bones of the hospital are good. And there's enough square footage here to do what needs to be done in this facility. But what we're really looking at is improving some of the flow, improving some of the patient uh, safety, 
and how the emergency department works and, and patient satisfaction and creating a much better patient and coworker uh, satisfaction through that. We would also update the patient rooms. The patient rooms are good size. They do have their own dedicated bathrooms. Some facilities, maybe you've seen over the years, they, they have a bathroom shared between two. So we have a good, good setup with the inpatient facilities and, and the inpatient beds. So we would primarily be doing some finish upgrades in that area. One of the other things, and maybe the most important things, are some of the infrastructure work. We're talking about a new 20-year roof, so tearing the existing roof off all the way down to the deck and going back with a new 20-year warranty roof and making the building watertight. We're also talking about new heat and air for the whole facility throughout. There are some very aged components to the HVA system. There are some components that have that are really at the end of their useful life. I am, I'm surprised some of it is, is still working. I, I haven't talked to you today, but hopefully it's still all working. Um, but it, it really is getting to the end of the useful life. Parts are getting harder to find. Repairing them is, is getting much more difficult. We're also talking about improving the plumbing systems as well as the major electrical systems within the facility. So really, Good structure, it just needs some improvement. There will be some minor improvements and enhancements to the exterior, but really what we need to accomplish first is let's get the inside flowing accurately, functioning properly, patient safety is of primary importance, and then the infrastructure, the heat and air, the lighting, the electrical, and the plumbing, all of those things that are just a must have within a hospital. Um, physical therapy. We're showing physical therapy up in the top in the, in the light blue. Our initial thought was physical therapy is a very important component to, to rural health care and to Muleshoe. It touches so many people in the community. We were thinking initially that maybe we would grow and expand the physical therapy, but I think after a couple last meetings and, and talking to some of the staff, maybe the better option is, is to move that physical therapy down there into that central area, right there where it's being, where the, where the cursor is. And having it closer to the front door, having it closer to the check-in desk and the registration desk, saving the expense of adding on to the building because we do believe there is enough square footage to do what we need to do we would have to relocate the existing uh, clinic there maybe down to where the business office is currently that used to be a clinic it can go back to being a clinic with with very little renovation work and again that would save some cost and and as mentioned before just trying to be good stewards of the money we realize there's not an unlimited budget and there are some real needs that, that do need to be addressed here. So with that, and thank you again. Thanks, Dan. Clay, if you could take and just kind of give oh, an overview of what we're going to be looking at, then we're going to probably get you with a couple of questions. Certainly. Good evening. My name is Clay Binford. I'm a bond lawyer, uh, not to be confused with a bail bond lawyer. Uh, can't get anybody to put in jail. Um, but I, I uh, practice municipal bond law, uh, which means that I assist uh, cities, county, school districts, hospital districts with getting money from investors into their construction funds to bring these types of things off the page and then work with the financial advisor to provide the investors with security so that they know that they're going to get repaid and allowing you to get the lowest cost of borrowing. Um, now, what we are doing today is we're talking about the concept of issuing debt that is secured by an ad form tax. Now, under the state of Texas, that is viewed as sacrosanct because a tax lien means that a lien is placed on your home um, in exchange for your payment to service the debt or the obligation of the entity that is um, issuing the obligation. Now, your right as citizens is to vote on that in a democratic process in order to grant the permission to the governing body of the entity to incur that obligation. And so there are procedural frameworks in place that are protective to the voter and to the taxpayer 
um, and we are here to make sure that all of those protections are respected in the process. Um, the first thing that we have to do um, in a bond election is that we are permitted to conduct an election on one of two uniform election dates. So it has to be on a uniform date, it can't be on an, a non-uniform date, and those occur in May and November of each year. Um, in order to um, hold an election on one of those two dates, we have to call the election far enough in advance so that you can provide plenty of notice to the electorate as to what's going to happen when and what they're going to be voting on. That deadline for the May election is uh, February 14th. Um, prior to um, that day, this governing body is required to adopt an election order that uh, includes a proposition uh, that would be placed to the voters um, in a yes-no format to approve the issuance of bonds um, for a particular purpose in a not-to-exceed amount. Um, so at that point in time, they have told you the limits on what they can spend the money upon and the maximum amount of money that they can borrow. So the question often is, well, what if we authorize this and they don't um, build what they said they would or they issue more debt than they promised that they would? These, uh, these characteristics are locked in and cannot be changed. It forms what's called the contract with the voters. And um, it cannot be broken. State law is very clear on this. Once you authorize the particular project and purpose and the dollar amount, um, those cannot be exceeded. They have to be respected. Um, so we draft this language. It is put in front of the board and they, they uh, uh, make a motion and they act upon it and they put the proposition out to the voters. And then you have the opportunity to vote yes or no. And based on the results of those uh, elections, um, assuming that it would be yes, then this board now possesses the authority to issue debt for the purpose in a not to exceed amount. Now that doesn't mean that you automatically become obligated to pay the debt. Um, the the, the uh, analog for this would be a credit card. When you go and get a credit card with a balance, you don't actually incur the obligation until you go out and buy something. That is similar to this. We have a $9 million credit limit, essentially, at that point in time. The board would then have to go and look at final construction estimates that Stephen prepares and the constraints that uh, Robert talked about um, that are uh, prevalent in the market at the time that we actually go to sell the debt, and we determine how much of that $9 million we utilize. Do we need eight and a half? Do we need eight? Can we only afford eight based on interest rate movements or assessed values? The board has the opportunity at a future point after the election to make that determination. Um, now, presuming that everything holds, um, we would issue the $9 million in bonds um, by the board action to authorize it after Robert and his team have gone to the market and sold your bonds to investors. And at that point in time, we would take the transcript of proceedings that start at the time of the election call all the way through the election proceeding, which means that we show that we adequately posted notice and published notice, that you conducted the election in accordance with law, that you canvassed the election returns, that you then came back and sold the bonds within the parameters that the electorate authorized, we take all of that documentation and we submit it to the Texas Attorney General's Office. The Attorney General's Office then confirms that we have been compliant with law and gives us what we call a validity and enforceability opinion, which means that nobody can come back and question the proceedings that are the basis for us incurring that debt. We then take those final bonds and we exchange them for money from the, uh, from the investors. We give them the bonds and the obligation to receive money or the right to receive money, our obligation to pay and we take their money and we put it in the construction account. And then the design goes from more conceptual to more refined and they will ultimately create a, a set of plans and specs that will go out for bid and you will have your construction contract that will result in your project being built. Now we have a, a, a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a difference here than we have in other places in that you as a hospital district have a legal limit of 75 cents of total tax rate. That you can um, that you can incur, but this community within that 75 uh, cent limit has artificially lowered it and said our maximum tax rate is only 40 cents. We will only take advantage of the first 40 cents of that 75 cents. We are currently at 40 cents, which means we don't have capacity for 10 cents to issue this debt. So we have to have a second proposition that would increase your max tax rate and an amount sufficient to accommodate this debt. Um, so you will see two propositions, assuming that this board acts to put the election order to the community, and it would be to increase your tax rate max and to issue the bonds. Now, from a credit perspective, Robert talked about this being a 20-year bond. 
If an investor um, is dependent upon your ability to levy a tax to repay its debt, and let's say you increase this tax rate from 40 cents to 50 cents, and then you issue debt that required 10 cents to levy or to amortize the debt, the investor is going to look at that and say, you have no capacity to deal with some kind of a downturn in the economy or a reduction in assessed value. So what we're going to do is for that risk that we're assuming, we're going to charge you a higher interest rate. It might never happen, but they're trying to hedge their bets from a risk perspective. So our recommendation is that you take that max tax rate up a little bit higher so that the investor knows that you have room in order to pay them back. Not that you'll ever have to levy the tax, but you will benefit from a lower interest rate by knowing that you simply have the capacity. So when you see the election order, if, it's a, if it is actually adopted by this board and put to the voters, you're going to see two propositions. One is the tax rate increase. That is just the rate and for the max increase that doesn't actually mean what your rate is going to be. And then the bond proposition that tells you the maximum amount of debt and the project that you will be authorized to spend this project. So that's my presentation. I can answer questions as I can. One thing he did not mention there, we are anticipating the maximum cap on the tax rate at 60 cents. That gives us the leeway from the, the amount that we have to charge to what the maximum could be. So if you, when you see that 60 cents, that does not mean that we're charging 60 cents. What we're looking at the numbers right here, it's gonna be 51, 52 cents, is that correct? Okay. One other thing that uh, Stephen didn't mention here also, part of our plans are, is the old nursing home and Dr. Pummel's clinic and everything down at the hospital, that'll all be torn down. It'll be gone. We had intentions of doing that here about a year and a half ago, and we was fixing to take and turn them loose, and we come find out we have a little issue with uh, some asbestos in there. So time we got that done, and we time figured out what it's going to cost to get that done. Uh, we didn't have enough money to do it, so we just put all that on hold. But part of the money that we're looking at right now, that that will be taken out, that will be cleaned up, and our intentions and plans are to take that a parking lot, so we'd have a little bit better access to the hospital and stuff like that. One other thing that, uh, that Stephen didn't mention also that uh, is have a new emergency ambulance entrance center and uh, something a little more uh, modern, up to date, and weather protected over there on that west side. Uh, they've got it drawn off to worry that it will work, and uh, that's another thing that, uh, that we're looking at. And I think we're now we're ready for questions. So here's what we're going to have to do. If somebody has a question, if you'll take and raise your hand, I'll bring the microphone to you. And you need to take and state your name and ask the question. Then we can take and go from there. And we have to do that because this is a public meeting. And actually this is a hospital board meeting. Well, this is a public meeting, so we have to have all that on record. So. Hi, Alan. my name is Bill Lyles. Have we paid off the uh, bonded and debtors on the nursing home? It will be paid off February 15th okay. of this year. So we're taking that money that we're already paying on the nursing home and it will be rolled over into the hospital there. That's the reason that it's only be going up 10 cents. So when, uh, well, like I say, if it gets all said and done, if you got a hundred thousand dollar home, you're looking at eight dollars fifty three cents per month. Cook Starbucks, a couple of soda pops, or whatever you want to do. So it, it, it's a very good, doable deal. Somebody else have a question? <coughs> Hello, Stephen. Ron again. Uh, what is the time frame on doing all this work? What our time frame is right now, we want to take and get this brought up to election in May second. And we get that done, we'll take and get it for the bonds, we'll take and be sold, and we'll get started on it pretty quick. It's gonna take them six to eight months just to draw the plans up. 
So we'll be taking probably looking next year before they do start doing actual construction. The timeline of taking and doing it from start to finish was estimated what a year and a half to a year and eight months, somewhere in that area. Because part of that's got to be done on certain sections here to take and then we don't take and disturb the other part over here. So we've got to have a place for the patients and have any protected areas. So, I mean, it's, it's just one of the things that you just got to do to take and work one part and come back and pick up another part. Does that answer your question, Ronnie? Yes. Okay. Somebody else have a question? Surely there's more than that. Ben Rose, what are you going to do with cost overruns? They always happen. We have a 30%, is that correct, contingency already built into this price. We know that we're going to be cost overruns. We have an extra amount to take and work with. That's it. There is no cost overrun, but we do have a contingency built into it. They're calling it soft cost, soft cost, or whatever. I'm calling it hidden cost. We got things out there we don't know what's in there, you know. So, I'm Erin Gonzalez. Um, I have a question about. I know that we need to make investments in infrastructure, but. What are you going to do as far as new services that are going to be offered? Does this extend any services that are already available through the hospital, or is this going to essentially just update the facility? Finish. <laughs> so what it will do is it will enhance the services that we are currently providing. Is there a specific service that you're wondering about? Yes, that's one-year investment. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and she brings up a very good point about coordination of services. What it will do is allow us to be able to be more effective uh, because of the structure of the way it is right now. So, uh, it, but adding services, no, we're going to enhance services for physical therapy. Most importantly, we're going to enhance the services of our emergency room so that we have the privacy and the safety that that you know. Any, I think any of you guys that have uh, come in here, come in through the emergency room, you know, you have to come in those back doors, you go by lab, you go by physical therapy, you go by x-ray, you go by the public bathrooms, you turn, you go down the hall, you go in front of admissions, um, and then you finally make it into the emergency room. And so with having that dedicated entrance, it helps with safety, it helps with privacy, it helps with all those things. So, in answer to your question in short is it will enhance the services that we currently have. Somebody else have a question? Sure, somebody got another question. <clears throat> My name's Cliff Black. Uh, I want to see if I've got this right. The nursing home will be paid off February 15th. The money that was designated for that after that point will all go to the hospital. If the bond passes. If the bond passes. If the bond passes. Okay. And there is no funds in this bond package that would go to the nursing home. Not at the present time, no. No upkeep. We no have changes, no nothing. We have some of this tax money that y'all take and pay in right now that is designated that goes to the nursing home. There is a certain percent of the money that comes in from the taxes that goes into the nursing home account. So there is some money over there. Where is that designated? What do you mean? Where's the funds designated that go to the nursing home? For emergency funds. Is it in if we budget? Yes. If it is in there and they have an air conditioner go down, we can take and pull from them funds to take and do the air conditioning. We don't have a choice if air conditioner goes out, 
we have to replace it. If we have funds that we got to take and send up to the government, there is funds in there to take and do that. It generally gets depleted before the year's out. So, did that answer your question, Cliff? Yes, thank you. There was another question that you had the other day. If I can get this right on that bond. The 7.67 cents that we currently pay on that bond right now. When it gets paid off, come next year, if we do not pass another bond, we do not get to collect that 7.67 cents. We stay at 32 cents or thereabouts for our maintenance and operations for the hospital. We get to recapture part of that, but uh, Clay said it will take several years to get all the way back up to the 40 cents. So, does that make sense to you? Did you ask that the other day? Yeah. Okay. I have one more question. What is your anticipated bond rating? I don't have a clue. The last bond rating was on a refinancing in 2010, and it was an A2 by Moody's Investor Service. A2 is a really good rating. Um, so I, I, it was a BAA1 on the first financing in 2000, and it was upgraded on the refinancing to an A2. So that's right in the middle of investment grade. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brett Bammer. My question so it's a 20 year bond. How is 20 years decided? So it's a good question. I nobody will answer it okay. better. We just looked at the numbers 20, 25, and 30. When you start getting above 25 to 30, there wasn't enough. I didn't think there was enough significant lower amount to take and pay for all that extra interest. You know, the more years you get out there, the more you can, that you're going to be paying. If it was at a number where I didn't think that the community could take and handle the 10 cents, we would have probably looked at that. We still haven't done anything yet. If uh, somebody wants to look at that, we can look at that. But that's, that's the reason we did not look at any further out. We also looked at different scenarios uh, at the hospital. We looked at doing from the very minimum of fixing the roof, the air conditioner, and the electrical, and some of the plumbing. Is one of them things that we take and did that, and we got through, nobody would be able to see that we done anything. And that was gonna take, what was it, four or five million, somewhere in that area? The number five. To do absolutely no cosmetic work. That was to take and do the very basic. So we can step up from eight to nine million, which is what we're looking at here, and we get to do some of the renovations that we was talking about in here. Who else had a question back in Brett? Nicky. Sorry. Well you answered part of my question. This is Nick Bammer. And so it does look like you're doing kind of the basic things here. I know there's lots of rules and regulations on hospitals. How does this set us up for the next 5, 10, 15 years? Are we looking at doing this again in a few years, or does this take care of that? That's what our anticipation is, that we take and do these things right now. And we're not going to have to take and come back in here a few years later to take and start updating something else because we didn't comply with this other to begin with. Our whole idea is to get this thing good enough for the next 20 years so we don't have to worry about it again. Now, that doesn't mean that they couldn't change the rules, which they do every now and then, so we can take and, but we're gonna take and do a responsible action that we believe will be the best for the community, the best for the hospital district, and for the residents. Um, Angela Reyes, I was just wondering, what is this gonna look like on the ballot? What is the wording? What are we looking for? There will be two questions on the ballot. <coughs> the 
Do you have on the screen? I don't have on the screen. Okay, we'll read it. Sure. So the first proposition is we'll have a for or against, so you'll have the option to, to pick uh, for or against the levy of annual taxes by the board of directors of the Muleshoe Area Hospital District for hospital purposes at a rate not to exceed 60 cents on each $100 valuation of all taxable property in the district subject to hospital district taxation. That is specified by statute in your enabling legislation. That is verbatim out of the enabling act. The only thing that's blank is the since which we filled in with 60. The next proposition would be for or against the issuance of, currently at blank dollar amount, the board has discretion to set that, of bonds by the Mule Shoot Area Hospital District for hospital facilities and the levying of a tax and payment thereof. That also is not quite as prescriptive uh, by the legislature as to what that says, but they ask for us to use this guidance. So we're not putting any Thing in there otherwise than, than what the state provides for us to deliver to voters. Did that answer your question? Okay. Ron and Dan, uh, you mentioned uh, putting a lien on. Uh, I guess I misunderstood. Uh, what did you mean by that? As with any tax that's levied, whether it be city, county, school district, the remedy for non-payment could be foreclosure on a home. That's why it is required to go through a vote before you can issue debt that is secured by that. This is no different than paying your normal hospital taxes, though. But because it is an increase in a rate for a capital project, the voters are given a right to vote. You've already voted on this twice, your 40 cent tax rate. You had an initial tax rate when the hospital district was created, which I believe was 25 cents. Then you had an election in 2000 for the nursing home that was also similar to this. It was a tax rate increase from 25 cents to 40 cents, plus the money for the capital project, which was the nursing home. And you, I heard somebody say, when would we come to this again? Um, it does seem to be a 20 year increment. The last time this happened was 20 years. And so we're doing exactly what was done in 2000 for the nursing home, increasing the tax rate and providing for a capital project. So there is precedent for this as to what's been done in this community. Someone else? There's one other thing that we have done and we've kind of organized the a packed committee and uh, so we can take it if you have some questions and somebody contacts you Cope Ellis is the head of that and uh, he has several members on his committee and they're going to be handing out information around so and what they have information they have will be very accurate information and they will be very informed so if they do approach you don't be scared because they do know what they're doing. Curtis Hunt. Uh, a lot of people are talking about what they've done in Demet with a food court type deal. I think it's more the nursing home, but I didn't, I didn't see the presentation. Is there anything like that in this deal? I think they've got a Starbucks, a no. Fuddrucker, that kind of stuff. I didn't know if they was going to have any type of... No, that's in the nursing home. That's what I'm saying. I just was curious because I didn't... Okay. Someone else have a question? Nick Baird. So what about the MO? I mean, do you anticipate an increase in MO at some point? Well, it's just like any other business. One of these days the MO is going to go up. Your maintenance and your operations, that's what the MO stands for. Uh, I don't anticipate it going up for a little while. Hopefully, that whenever we take and get that new roof on there, that we get everything put back in there like it needs to be, the heating and air conditioning like it needs to be, 
that our utilities will go down. And that is one of the big issues that we have. Maintenance has been one of the big issues at the hospital. And if we get remodeled, hopefully they'll go down. The better. You know, that's what we're paying for. You know, and that's what we're anticipating. We didn't pay for it yet. But, uh, Jerry, you know, we can talk to Jerry over and see how much the maintenance is. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he stays busy constantly. And, uh, but that's just, that's what happens when you have an old building. And everybody knows it. Part of this old building was built back in the 40s. It had that update in the 70s. So, like anything else, they're not made to last forever. We're going to have to do something. I don't want to say that we've got to do it right now, but there's a great opportunity right now because we do have low interest rates and they can't go down much more. If they go down much more, they're going to be paying us. And that's not going to happen. But the interest rates are very, very low. And it's something that, you know, we've worked the numbers enough and we've looked at everything. We believe that this right here is a very, very doable deal. And it's one that they can benefit all of you. Scott Miller, I just preferred management services. Do we have a, a long-term lease with them? And if so, do we have a any secured uh, lease agreement for the how much we they're getting paid? <laughs> okay. All right. So that's a good question, Scott. Uh, so the answer is yes. Um, they're currently just renewed for a five-year contract. Um, well, it will be in, in March, but uh, it will be for another five years. Um, so, so the answer is yes. Preferred, preferred wants to stay here. Uh, they want to be able to provide access to health care in Beta County. Um, and so... So does that answer your question? But the answer is yes. Yes. Leanne Goldman. Uh, my question is, so part of the hospital district goes into Parmer County. So are you meeting with Parmer County residents as well? I have not yet even thought about that, to tell you the truth. Uh, it's pretty hard to figure out exactly what part of Parma County that uh, the people, a lot of them don't even know where they're at. I know, I've got a map. <laughs> it's basically about a mile north of 145 back south. Uh, so, no, I didn't even talk about that. Really. Okay. 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 Aaron Gonzalez. So you made a comment earlier about making a community announcement because this is going to come up to be decided if it's going to be put on the ballot. So I'll be real honest. I work in healthcare, and somebody sent me a screenshot of this this morning where I would have had no idea. So how are you going to make sure that everybody in the community knows that this is coming up, that we need to make a decision to say, yes, we want this on the ballot, we need to go and vote or not? Because quite frankly, I understand that Facebook is kind of how things get out, but... Nobody buys the city paper anymore. How is your committee that you were talking about going to get out of the community? We have put it on Facebook. And that's about the only other thing we've got. We can put it in the paper, nobody reads it. You know, and the rest of it's going to have to be word of mouth. Are you going to put a sign up at Lee Owls or are you going to put it up at the grocery store? They did talk about maybe getting some bigger signs and putting up the little yard signs. That's not anything that I don't think that we want to do. That is not my decision to do that. That gets back into what Colt and, and their committee was going to do. Colt, you want to answer that? <laughs> uh, that's one thing we talked about last night. Um, we had our first meeting last night. And... Uh, 
We were basically talking about how nobody takes the newspaper anymore. Used to, you could put information in the newspaper and get out to everybody in the community. Um, the biggest key we're going to work on is getting some brochures put out uh, to different places in the community. We feel like uh, as people visit those places, it'll pass that information along. And I think uh, more as the word gets out, then uh, I think more people, you know, figure out about it and start asking more questions. There are statutory requirements for publication and posting of notice. I understand that uh, getting people to actually pay attention to them can be a little bit more difficult, but we have to post notice at least 21 days before the election in at least three public places, plus where we post meeting notices. We have to post notice in every polling location while it's open for polling. We have to put it on the, on the uh, website, and we have to publish it in the newspaper twice with the first date of publication being at least 35 days before the election. Now, what we also do is we take an informational campaign because when you when you call an election, well, you can't the, the entity uh, that's holding the election cannot electioneer, meaning they can't advocate for or against the passage of the measure. There is a requirement to get factual information out, and what Robert, Robert's team does, uh, typically for school districts, but all of their clients that conduct elections, they prepare a one-page informational that talks about what's being built but also tax rate implications, what the bond size really is, what interest rates are doing based on their assumptions, how much it's going to cost per home, and give you all of these tables. And we provide that to the district, and our recommendation is typically for that to get mailed out. Mailed out to the taxpayers, mailed out to the people that are going to be voting. What does the voter log look like? And get that in the mail, because that is their obligation as an organization to get that information out. And whether or not people read it, you know, that's really about all we can do. Somebody here have a question? Another question out there earlier. Yeah. Hello, I'm Robin Atwood. I was just wondering about the cost that where we're paying out for life, that first amount of laundry. Are we going to put anything in house where we could possibly cut costs? Doing our own laundry, like housekeeping and stuff like that does. Will we be building something to acquire it? That's one of the things that we'll be taking doing whenever we take it. If we get past and get this bond passed, then we can take and implement that stuff in there. What we're looking at right up here is just the main things that has to be done, and that's the main thing. And so specifically in regards to laundry services um, when when we looked at this previously uh, the cost of adding laundry services would far exceed the cost that we're currently spending because of there are no facilities there now. And you add those machines and add the extra labor and compare that cost to what it costs to have it done outside, um, it was not feasible. It doesn't mean it won't be in the future. It doesn't mean that if we consider putting it into this, that it might, it might work out a little bit better, but initially when it was looked at, it was not feasible to, to build your own laundry in-house. Because of the regulations too, it makes it quite more quite a bit more extensive. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but it has been looked at. And yes, it is expensive, but it's probably more expensive to do it in-house. One other thing that we need to, want y'all be made aware of, our heating and air conditioning system, if they want it to heat, Jerry has taken get up in the attic somewhere and get up there and kick it move a lever that they can get it to run heat into the room. So if they want air conditioning, you gotta do the same thing. There's not a regulated deal, it's either hot or it's cold. And uh, pretty much it on that part. Somebody have another question?
This is uh, not so much. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm Earl Barron. I'm a newcomer here. I've been here 20 years. So half the people in here before and been here before I was. But anyway, um, we're talking about spending money. We're talking about uh, uh, tax increase, and uh, it is a town hall meeting. So, Gil, are you going to be showing this on TV? It'll be up tomorrow. Okay. I want to talk mainly to this group here. We're talking about saving money where we can. Uh, we know any school board members, any school board members here tonight? We're looking for an AD. <laughs> <laughs> Did you realize that Bailey County is one of three counties in the state that has a tax on automobiles? We do. I don't, know where, I don't know how long ago that was put into place, but three in the whole state of Texas assess taxes on automobiles. And, and, and I feel like this is my only opportunity to get up in front of the public and say, why is there not two in the state of Texas? Why is Bailey County still doing that? They, somebody told me last week that their income is like $70,000 a year for that. Uh, I worked for an old boy one time, he owned a fuel company, he said there's never, I've never seen a temporary fuel tax, never. It's sold as temporary, once it gets on the books it's there. You can't ever get it off. Well that's the way I see this uh, tax on our cars and pickups and stuff. If we're ever ever and i may be the only one in here that wants that off if we're ever going to get it off now's the time you know, we talk to our school board members and say hey as an act of faith because i believe we need a new hospital or an improved hospital i believe it's an integral part of the town and it'll make or break depending on the the uh, quality of health care we have so as an act of faith, because I know the city a couple of years ago said we're not assessing city taxes on, on the cars and the pickups, but the school still is. So I come to you guys and say, talk to your school board members and say, look, it looks like we're all trying to work together. We're all trying to make this work. You guys don't need to be assessing taxes on 10 year old cars from from brand new cars to 10 years old that's what they assess so think about it do what your heart tells you to do and i may be the only one thank you Cindy Purdy, first of all, let me tell you that Bruce was going to be here, but he has a sick baby in the hospital, so he, he is where he is needed. We are very excited, Lord, about what you are doing, the possibilities of enhancing our medical services for our children, our grandchildren, everything. These two guys and I were on the committee when we passed a huge bond for the school. Stacy was just telling me that they presented 23 presentations around our community over the time from when we started to the bond election. It's very difficult. Erin, I appreciate what you said about notification on that because we were wondering. I had seen it, but then I couldn't find it anymore. It's so important. And we concentrated on the two biggest employers in Muleshoe, one being the school, one being the hospital. And the superintendent let the teachers out to go vote because it was that important. The hospital at that time encouraged the hospital employees to get out and vote. The community really worked hard 
for our school bond, and I know we can do it for our hospital bond. And we're really excited, really appreciate all of your work, all of the planning that you have done. I'm going to hand this to Stacy because he was the head of the school. He, I'm sure you're excited about talking, but just the communication the factor of getting the word out, the positive word out. Stacy Connor, I, I would say that um, the thing is you've got to communicate the need, the, the desperate situation with the facilities and that sort of thing. There will always be tension between maintenance and payroll and, and uh, those kind of operating things. But when people see the need, when they realize the air conditioner is X number of years old, that you're spending X number of dollars a year to keep that air conditioner running and it's still not working efficiently, it kind of softens the idea of what's going on. And, um, and so, and everybody has a roof, and everybody who's ever had a leaky roof knows the value of having a roof that doesn't leak. And so, and the, the one thing that you guys are going to have that we faced a little bit at the school is um, anytime you tear into a wall, you don't really know what's in that wall until you get torn into it. And so you've got to build in some of that. And you can communicate those kinds of things. But uh, but I'm, I'm part of part of helping Colt out, and we'll get this. We'll get this. You know, getting the word out, that's kind of a, a problem anymore. And if anybody's on Facebook, you can go back in there and look at the hospital board elections. Is that what it's called? Is that what it's called? This year. This year. Bond. Okay. If you click on that, you can take and follow that. If you take and start sharing it, that's one thing, one way to get the word out. Well, if you take in and visit with someone, just mention it. You know, you've got some good information now. We've got some good numbers to take and work with. We can take and work these. So, you know, there's been some already that, you know, somebody's spreading some rumors that outrageous numbers. Well, it's not that away. These are some numbers that'll work. Something that will work. It'll work for everybody. Someone have another question? Y'all are very, very quiet. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, do you have a question? Do you have a question? I have a question. Ronnie Dan, this is not so much a question as really a statement. Um, most of us, when we go to the hospital, we're either in an emergency room or in there to see someone or in the room. But if you've ever gone back, way on back, to the old nursing home and the old mechanic room where Jerry works, uh, we really do need the update. And. Uh, you know, for each individual's cost, and I know it's hard for some, but the hospital is very vital to this community. And uh, we have some good doctors, and uh, I know I've been blessed to know Dr. Purdy, and uh, he's blessed this hospital a great deal. So, uh, you know, I'm sure, Alan, if you want to go see him, he'd take a tour through the hospital and show you what we're talking about. And uh, if you take that tour, uh, you'll come out saying, yes, we do need an updated hospital. Ann Goldman. Dr. Burke is here and I just uh, wonder what he would say about attracting physicians and things like that and how important the facility is. You can have to stand up over here so they get you on camera. All right. All right. My name is Dr. Burke. I've uh, lived here since July of 2018. I started working here August 2018. 
I really look for this kind of practice, but I think we talked about it a little bit at the last board meeting, that it would help attract not just maybe future physicians, but nursing staff as well. Nurses that have graduated from Lubbock and are looking for a job, especially some younger ladies that are looking to be nurses, want to come here and work. I think that would go a long ways to retaining staff as well. Um, I can say I'm excited about this. I think it's great for the community and it's great for being able to provide medical care to this community as well. I hadn't planned to uh, speak, but um, about a year ago, I uh, brought it to the board and told them I wanted to write an article about um, what the hospital meant to the community. And I did that, and it was in the newspaper. Probably wasn't seen by many, it was kind of hidden. Um, and I, I did a lot of research. Um, and as Mrs. Purdy pointed out, the two largest employers in Milshi are the school and our hospital district. Our hospital district employees, uh, close to 95, between 95 and 100 people. Think of the households that that affects. Um, also, did you know that, um, I don't know if you've ever had this happen in your personal life, that um, they can have a, um, what is called a, uh, a diversion at the larger hospitals when you have a flu or strep or uh, some other pneumonia epidemic that sometimes we will have people that we need to transfer and we have called Lubbock and Amarillo and they said we can't take anymore so what would we do if this place if Mill she wasn't here another large study I did and I really don't think I got all the numbers when I did it because I didn't realize at the time that we had started using more than one um, helicopter service. You would not believe the times the helicopter comes into Mulesheet a week, at least once a week. But for a while, I worked at the school administration office for 25 years. So I can stand there and hear the, the helicopter come in. And I could count that it was coming in at least three times a week because it comes over our building to land two blocks away at the hospital. Um, what would we do if we did not have the services we have to stabilize those patients to get those to another community? There are just so many things that a rural hospital does. And I could go on and on. I have the list that I wrote last year, and I browsed over it this morning, uh, but have been busy since then. Anyway, that kind of goes back to your question uh, to Dr. Berg. What, you know, what's the importance uh, there are just so many little things. You know, I, I, I even know of a personal story. It wasn't my family, but a friend. Um, at, this was many, many, many years ago. But they um, did not use the hospital here. Uh, a woman had a husband that had a heart attack. Uh, she decided to put him in the car and drive him to the VA hospital. And he died in route. You know, he died in her vehicle 30 minutes down the road instead of bringing him to a small rural hospital where he could be stabilized and transferred on. And let me just mention one more thing and then I will give this back to Alan because like I hadn't even planned to speak, but I just want people to know how important it is, uh, like I said, to stabilize. Another huge thing for our little hospital is the, um, I'm just going like, swing bed program. I don't know how many of you are, in, are um, aware of that. <clears throat> so, um, and I've had friends that say, oh, well, you know, I don't use a hospital here, or I go to Lubbock, or this or that. Never fails that, you know, they have a loved one that is transferred to Mulesheet, or has to be flown to Mulesheet, or has to be brought to Mulesheet, or having a heart attack, something. But our swing bed program has been so successful. I will even have a next door neighbor that would tell you that. And she had not come back. She went to Lubbock. She had shoulder surgery. She thought she was going to be home in six days. Well, it did not go quite as smoothly as she thought. And she spent about 10 days in the hospital in Lubbock. And she thought they were going to put her in Trust Point. I'm not dissing Trust Point or anywhere else. But she wanted to be in Mule Sheep. You know, she wanted her next door neighbor to come see her. She wanted her daughter who lives out at Lions Bay to come and see her daily. And, 
And so, and you know the people. So when you're stuck up in Lubbock rehabbing, that's much harder. And Swing Bed is an excellent program for Mule And that's where the enhanced rehabilitation, the re enhanced uh, physical therapy, uh, <coughs> speech therapy, um, what other therapies? <coughs> Occupational therapy. Uh, those are so important. Respiratory, Respiratory therapy. And so we're just so thankful to have those, but I can't tell you how nice it is to come back to Muleshoe and recoup if you've had something done. I know that I would want one of my parents or my husband or any family member to be able to have that. That is so handy, especially if you're a working person. If you're, you know, if you had to get off work each day and go check on that person or it's in Lubbock. I mean, Lubbock's wonderful, but it, we just don't realize how many services we offer and how important they are to this small town. And like I said, number one being, we employ 95 people. That affects 95 households. So that's huge in, in a small town. And uh, so I think those are things that we need to consider. Okay, thanks. Good morning. She's talking about that uh, information that she put in the paper. And if y'all come in, y'all probably got a copy of that. You need to read that. This hospital does a whole lot more than what a lot of people think. Of, because unless you're down there all the time, you really don't know. But there is a lot of stuff that goes on down there. This hospital is vital to this area. I'd like to have it look a little nicer be a lot more serviceable to the community and we can't do it sitting on what we got what it boils down to and i don't want to take it get it remodeled don't want to build a new one i don't think we can afford it but we can't afford this remodel here anybody else have any questions y'all have any comments you want to make Add two, take away. Okay. Do we want to vote on that? Okay. Do we have to have certain wordage to take and do that? I think you probably want to show your agenda on the board if you can. Okay. I'm sorry. As far as nine million, yeah. Yes, we have to the pocket board. Yeah. So, um, so you would. So we have an agenda item. I'll just read this off. Consider and act upon an order calling a maximum tax rate and bond election to be held by the Muleshoe Area Hospital District, making provision for the conduct of the election and resolving other matters incident and related to such election. This will give you the opportunity to discuss it. Um, someone could make a motion to approve the order calling the maximum tax rate um, election at 60 cents and a bond election in the amount of nine million. That would then be your motion on the floor. You can discuss it and take a vote. I so move. I second. Gail moved it. Dana seconded it. We have a motion on the floor to take and consider the bond election. The maximum amount on the bond will be $9 million. We will take and raise our tax cap to 60 cents. All those in favor, raise your hand. All those, nobody opposed. It passes, Jody. So, we order the election. I want to thank each and every one of y'all for coming out and hearing us and I appreciate the question so much. You know, because if you have a question and you don't get it answered, you start thinking about things and it just starts building and building and building. Because you don't have the right information. So if you have a question, we'll answer it. And from now on, if you have a question, you can call me, you can call anyone on the board, you can call Cole. We call the hospital down there, Dennis's office, and he can refer 
back to me or whatever. But I want everybody to know that, you know, we're here to take and answer your questions. We're going to be out taking canvas in the community, trying to promote this. So somebody comes knocking on your door, you kind of know what's going on. Stephen Lawson with Reese Architects again. Um, Josh and I will stay after and we'd be happy to answer any questions. I know this may be a little difficult to read on the screen for some of the people in the back. So we'll go over to the boards and we'd be happy to answer any questions or provide uh, any clarity to what's been up on the screen. Yeah, this what he has drawn off is not drawn in concrete. We will still take and do some changes on it. These are just preliminary drawings, preliminary thinking. But it is a plan that we can take and start working toward that area. Yep. Make a motion, we adjourn. Second. 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 Motion made by Dana, second by Zona. Then we take and adjourn. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you all for coming out. I really do thank you all a lot. Thank you.